Hello and welcome to Photographic Connections, the podcast where we create connection to self, nature and others through the art of photography. My name is Kim Grant, the founder of Photographic Connections and your host for this podcast. And today I am absolutely delighted to welcome Mally Davis onto the podcast. Mally is a creative photographer and content creator based in England and he has a very refreshing, mindful approach to his work. We speak about how studying art in his earlier years has really benefited him in his photography journey. We also talk about the importance of expressing ourselves, how creativity is more prevalent now than ever before, and the incredible healing power of photographing nature. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Mally Davis. Well, hello, Mally. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast this week. It's an absolute pleasure to connect with you again because we actually spoke only a few weeks ago now when I was kindly invited to interview you as part of an, another online series uh, by Nisi Filters called The Light Club. And we delved quite deeply into your photography, showcased a number of images, and you spoke through your beautiful imagery. And I really, after that interview, wanted to get you on the podcast because your philosophy around photography is, it's so beautiful and there's so much of your journey and your vision and and how you carry out your work that really resonates with me. And I think we're quite similar in some ways. So before we delve deeper into those things that I'd like to go into, I'd love you to, to tell anybody listening, really, what got you into photography in the first place? there's a lot of kindness there what you've just said um thank you very much yeah it was good fun the nissy talk yeah it really was even though it is weird being on this side uh being asked questions and 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 not always knowing the answers so when you say philosophy i, I do tend to just go with my heart and go with me soul and what i feel and think in terms of visual elements and photography and I guess that started at a very young age. Um, like all photographers say this, don't they? Say, I was given a Kodak Instamatic when I was six, and that and that's true. I was, but I went through a lot of different throwaway cameras and spent a lot of time on holidays, uh, which taking photos of things that you know, cats in the holiday home and trees here and there, and and. We went to a valley in Gloucester, the the Y Valley, a place called uh, uh, just outside of there called Lydney, and you, it was as a child you could wander off on your own because it was safe and investigate streams and go under bridges and walk through forest land, you know, and and not ever have to worry a, a jot about anything, and and that really I think is where it all began and my granddad my granddad was a see it's like when they say you're a pro photographer an amateur my granddad was an artist but he never actually made any money out of it i have his paintings and he painted a lot of landscapes of places he'd never been and sometimes they were from his mind and i've been to places since that i've seen places that look like his his paintings and it's quite shocking because he never went there, but yet he envisaged the landscape and painted them and they came to life and they were. So that, that was a huge inspiration for me, granddad, for my family, from holidays, from using a, a plethora of cameras and then getting to college, university, learning how to use a Patterson tank in dark room. I'm not going to profess to be in a film photographer because it is really hard and it is an art form in itself uh, and um, I ju- it, it was very tactile and that's why I, I enjoyed it because the, I do think there's a lot of similarities and people forget sometimes between what we do as digital photographers and what a film photographer does is almost the same, they're just a, a means to an end to producing a piece of art or a photography. And as I've said to you last time, to the final point, which is print, which takes me nicely to where I ended up because my me, me love for photography, I, I didn't realise it was always there. 
but didn't realise that I could say make a living from it or I never thought that this could be tangible and I went off trying all kinds of different genres and being a fine artist and getting into abstract expressionism and then through college and university and the Macintosh computer came round, the SE2 and one we called the Big Mac, which was in 1994. So the progression from Aldous Freehand, uh, Adobe One, Quark Express One, the early days of software and um, still didn't realise how much I should have had a camera and how much I should have been going out doing photography until now. Uh, we'll say I've been doing this f probably full on since about 2012 and I was quite rubbish at it. I'm still trying to get better. <laughs> we all have to start somewhere, That's me. don't we? We all have to start somewhere. Yeah. No, it's amazing. There's a lot in what you said there. And I love that connection you had to nature as a child. It's very similar to, to me. You know, I was brought up in a pretty safe place yeah. and I was able to go out by myself or with, you know, fellow children and just enjoy nature without adults. And it's very rare nowadays, actually. I don't think many children get the opportunity to do that. But in some ways, it's important when you, you have the opportunity to either live somewhere that you can do that or when you go on holidays and you've got that, that safe space. It's beautiful that nature has played that part in your life the whole time. Yeah. And obviously, you know, you said your granddad there was a kind of big inspiration to you with the painting and the art. And you actually went and studied quite a bit in art, didn't you, before you actually picked up a camera properly? Uh, yeah, it, it, probably I should be a doctor, really. The amount of time I spent in college doing um, art and design and fine art, and it, it, so it was. It was when I got to to main college that I discovered the camera, and and like I say, using Ilford four hundred and shooting with a Practica, I think it was, and uh, try a Minolta as well. I think yeah, it was if you was lucky, you know, which camera you got because he had about six cameras and some were duffers and. The Practica were always a decent camera. I say that it was a big silver tank. Um, so from colleges starting off uh, after leaving school, ironically, and I've never told this story before, when I was leaving school, my teacher didn't submit my college application because he decided for me that I wasn't good enough, that I would never make it as an artist, and he never submitted my application. And me and my friend was two of us and we went into school to see him and he told us outright that he thought we should have done something, we should be doing something else and didn't put our application in. So we lost the places to an art college in St. Helens where I live called The Gamblers and it was a three-storey building and it was a library and archive and on the top floor, huge massive rooms they were like 20 30 feet high cavernous rooms filled with all tables splattered in paint the walls were splattered in paint and you had a print room you had a textiles room you had all these areas and a shop a tuck shop and you could buy your paint brushes your paints and all this and we couldn't get a place so i applied for another college where the lead singer from the verve was at doing art <laughs> <laughs> unbelievable Richard Ashcroft was there and I never got to meet him because as fate would have it switched and the gamblers got in touch with me and my friend and said we have two places left we'd like you to come along so I refused the application to a different college where I could, probably could have ended up in the Verve he says dreaming and <laughs> and ended up at the Gamblers Institute in St Helens and did three years of art, design, fine art, going through all the disciplines from using printing presses, through using um, plates, printing uh, with chemicals, to etching, eat away at the metal. And then we did all, it was wonderful, a wonderful college. We did lots and lots of different art forms using gouache was a big one, which I really like, was painting in flat planes. And that explains, I think, a lot of my photography. A lot of people talk about the rules of foreground interest and me, you know, mid ground and for and 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 for me, I, I I try, but I don't see. Sometimes I see things in planes of fields, like almost like flat areas of depth. And 
it is really difficult as a photographer to get away uh, away from graphic design. I've been doing it for so long, so it, it, it does influence what I create. And um, I think I think with college and all those years, and also the artists are like Wallace E. Kandinsky, Gustav Klint, Jean Miro, um, Salvador Dali, um, the futurists like Jacob Epstein. There were so many I could I could just keep going on and on and on about all these different uh, artists that jumped into my soul, if you like, because at that point I was very. Uh, um, it was very easy to to influence me 16 to 26 was a huge uh, part of my life where i was very much into the arts and and loved absolutely loved everything to do with art and design going to paris going to places all over the country and spending say once a month going to the tate gallery and and seeing people like bridget riley who was a lady who did 3d kind of optical illusion art and um and and i think all that as as has played a role in 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 what i do now and and so i think i'm not i can't think of the word i'm not authentic to th photography i just do what i love and what i feel is right to me mm -hmm. beautiful do you know it, it's good that you told that story there i think of of your teacher not submitting your application because it almost shows sometimes in life that what's meant mm. for you almost won't pass you by and it's like you know you had this deep desire to get into art and it, I don't know there's a few photographers I've spoken to just over the last few years who have slightly similar stories you know they they were trying to get into art or photography and they were told you're not good enough you know you're never going to make it or whatever and that deep desire within them they just kept going and then things just opened up for them and and they got there and all of your experiences I guess when you were studying and everything it's really played into to what you've now ended up doing as a photographer so I do find creative people tend to have more than one creative outlet than just one and it'd be really interesting for you to kind of delve into how studying in art particularly has gone on to help you with your vision and your work and your photography. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. It's a tough question uh, it, to kind of spin away from that a little bit where you say about other forms of creativity. I play keyboards and synthesizers and I was in bands when I was younger and I used to paint, do huge paintings on, on the walls in gigs live and stuff like that and I'd paint canvases live and um, I was, I'm, I'm very much into that um not so much craft work, but psychedelia and, and, and the beginnings of, of uh, prog rock and all that kind of nonsense, weird and obscure art, if you like. So I I, I painted landscapes from my mind. I, I painted like scenes of valleys and, and cloudscapes. And I really love clouds and cloudscapes. And yeah, I sound like a hippie here, don't I? But... <laughs> Um, that to me, seeing all those elements and through college and clouds are so important as a landscape photographer. I know you're deeply into your macro at the moment, but I think even with macro, you can you can create these worlds that have cloudscapes without clouds. And uh, my last video that I've just put out, um, there's some images in that called uh, The Sea Within. And the first three images are actually clouds, they're not sea. I don't know if anyone has realized this because they're so abstract. And and I like that fact that what we see, what we perceive isn't always um, true, that um, clouds can be the sea and the sea can represent the clouds because they are very similar in shape and form and fluidity in the way they move, texture, tone, especially using long exposures and playing with filters and and things so the influence from college um has taught me that if you like college creates an openness it makes you open-minded it makes you think beyond what you would say and all we get told to think or how you should think and behave um which is which is strange because I ended up being a graphic designer for 25 years and that's very much you told what to do and say in the commercial world side of that you know you when you're working as a designer 
you're almost like a computer operator. You're told, make it big, make it red, put that in the top corner, put that there. And, and by people who not necessarily always know what's best or they've not been trained in branding or compositional rules or, or grid systems and things like that. So college was really freeing, was really um, a place to open your imagination and really... Uh, it still excites me. I going out with the camera reminds me of the days of college because there was no, there's no restrictions, and I, and I, and also if if anyone watches the video I've just put out called the Sea Within, that has no, sp I've not speaking in it, and if anyone who knows my channel, I never shut up, as you can hear right now. I, Sorry, Kim. It's all right. I thought Go I'd find it. this really difficult. <laughs> I thought I'd find this really difficult to talk, and now I'm wondering when I'm going to shut up. But <laughs> um, I don't talk in this video, and I feel it's really important that we express ourselves and don't feel that we're governed by certain rules that YouTube tells us to behave and represent ourselves in a certain way. And sometimes, I actually said it tonight to a friend, it's a gamble, but who's it a gamble to? If you're true to yourself and do what you love, it's not a gamble, it, it's your right, it's your choice to do that. Whether people like it or not is a, is a different thing. And if it was a commercial entity, which is why I, I link it to college, because it's that freedom of expression, it's that idea of an open-mindedness, it's that idea of, of being allowed to experiment and not fear, and this is the important thing, not fear what other people might think or say about what you're doing. And and for you to really put all that aside and just go with what you feel in, is right to you. But I always say this and relate back to the idea that it, it still has to have an aesthetic that's pleasing, not just to yourself, but others, you know, there's some art out there that you see and, and yes, it, it, they might find it's expression, it's creative and it's for them and it's it's what they want to do and that's great. And not everyone will like everything and I'm not saying you should make things that are pretty or suit people but I do think, and I think this is from my design days, that it has to have an accuracy, it has to have a, a professionalism about how you present that work even if it's madness, it still should have something that it hangs on that's solid and gives it a professional look first and foremost. And then the experimentation flows out of that. Mm. And uh, that definitely comes from my college. Mm. That's really interesting there, just thinking about you know YouTube particularly and relating that to the commercial mm. side of things. And how I think there's a lot of content out there that teaches you or tells you how you should do YouTube, how you should create your videos, what you should be making videos about, what people are gonna watch, what should yeah. your thumbnail look like, what should your title be like. But actually I've yeah. just come to realize that it's what might work for one person doesn't work for the other, but equally it is about that being true to yourself. And I think that's something that I find really humbling about your work is you are clearly very true to yourself. You're bringing a lot of stuff from your past and from your artistic background into your work and you're very true to yourself. You're not afraid to do abstract work that's a bit out there. You're not afraid to show things which other people may not perceive as, as being your kind of stereotypical photography, but it gives you so much joy, so much awe, so much wonder. And when you combine that with your lovely, friendly personality, it gives your work real deep meaning because and that's something I've battled with on my channel for years it's like you go through this stage of of wanting to get subscribers and views but I've kind of realized yeah. in the last six months particularly that getting more subscribers and views doesn't actually matter to me anymore what matters to me is the people that are that relate to me and who like what I do are you know continue to enjoy my content but that it still continues yeah. to be true to me and particularly in the last two months it's I'm, I'm really beginning now to create content that is true to me and that I'm not trying to impress somebody or do what I'm told we're supposed to do because 
it, it, it stops the enjoyment. You know, how easy do you find it in your channel to keep that authenticity and keep being true to you with that experimentation? And, you know, do you still feel like pressure of people liking it or are you are you quite good, would you say, in just trying to be as authentic as, as you possibly can? That's an excellent question. And you can see that with your channel. And it is, um, we set off because we want to be successful. And for me, I never thought I'd get anywhere with it. And it was just, I'll have a go and kept going and kept going. And there's never been, there's never been a pressure until I'd say the past year. Um, I've always just, I doesn't matter when I put a video out because they always say you should put one out every week, blah, blah, blah. And I, I've never done that. And uh, obviously, and people might not know I'm, I'm married. I've got two children, and it, it, the time time is a, is is the most important thing in life for me. Time is is how how you use that time is key, and um, and we all procrastinate and what have you. But the pressure, what you're saying, um, it's almost like Adam Carnat did a video where he had a devil on a shoulder and an angel on the other, and. The idea of like I, sometimes it's not always, but I, you can hear this other voice and something inside you saying, "Come on, you need to put seven ways to <laughs> you need to say something where people are gonna learn in this video." And then I just end up wandering off and not doing that, and and then I think, "Oh, it'd be so easy if you planned." And then I think, "But I don't want to plan. I just want to." I want to let it flow. Some people might call that winging it, but I just see it as this is my moment when I'm out with the camera and I'm excited and because it's happening. Even if it's not, there's always something. There's always something to see. But that isn't then a formulaic. It's not. And and I feel that pressure of, come on, you need to make something formulate. You need to make something that will get you the views. You need to have a title, the thumbnail. And that that battle, it does it does occur now, and 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 I have to push it to one side, and and just think, do you know what? You've gone this far, you've been doing this for five years this year. I'm coming up to seven thousand subscribers, which is truly amazing to think of that many people, and 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 the views I get, um, are regular, which I think is key a key thing. Uh, a gentleman, Sean Tucker, I'm sure you know him, we all know Sean, if you don't, you really must, his philosophy and his YouTube channel is wonderful, and he makes the statement of a thousand true, don't want to use the word fans, I think he does use fans, but a thousand true followers or watchers of your YouTube channel and your photography, that concept, that idea for me is is now the goal i feel that if i could have a thousand fans that that love what i do and and stick with me and and even support you financially either by and this is key this is really important this is why the pressure goes away is to sell either a print to to buy my book and future books to either join me on patreon where there's meetups and soon more content to come. I only have one tier on there, and it's a support thing, but we meet up once a month. And that releases that pressure, because what happens by doing that is you realise that people are in, into what you're doing, people are interested, and then the idea of chasing figures and numbers goes away somewhat. YouTube is is terrible, or YouTube is is can really twist your head and make you think, oh, what have I done wrong here? What do I need? And I've done it myself. I've changed the title. I've changed the thumbnail. And I have to stop and think. Do you know what? It's gone. I've made it. I've put it out there. It's it's going. It's gone. If no one watches it, you've not done anything wrong. It's just not accepted on this occasion by the wider audience, or YouTube doesn't see it's worth suggesting. And that's the key. I think YouTube suggests things based on brand product because endorsements helps them to make money 
and it keys into the algorithm of, of where if you mention a brand, they can base adverts on that. And I've seen it. It's like, you know, your phone's listening and it'll suggest adverts and things. I feel with YouTube as creators, it knows what we're putting out. If I mention something, and the other thing I've realized as well is adverts. And I do have adverts on my channel because, again, I think it's just another way of supporting what I do because what we do, we do for free. You know, when you think what you get for your videos compared to how much energy and effort you put in, it is minimal. Now, I'm not I'm not saying I expect people, I think content should be free. But I also believe that I don't come with a begging bowl. I've, that's why I've tried so hard to create prints and create a book and create something that is of um, a product of value that you buy. And by doing that, by creating the podcast and creating certain scenarios where people can cross my palm with gold, um, it feels then more genuine and it feels then that I'm not chasing figures and numbers and it eases the pressure. But I have to say, and I'll say in that, and I'll be true to myself, I'm not going to lie, I have said at the beginning of this year, I would love to hit 10,000 subscribers. And people say it's just a number. And that, that is true. It is. But for some reason, I feel, I know you, you know, well, what, what about 20 then? What about 50? What about 100? But I do feel if I got to 10,000 subscribers, I'm done. I'm done because I feel at that, that number, the thousand kicks in, the thousand true followers kicks in when mm. you get to that point and I do then believe I've achieved something I, it's goals isn't it life goals you wouldn't go through life thinking you know what I'm not going to achieve nothing and just go through life uh, so I, I do think it's important to have set targets set goals because it does propel you forward and it's not like in a um, you know in a oh, capitalism way where you've got to constantly keep growing I do feel that the goal of 10,000 on subs on YouTube kind of makes me feel then the doors open even more and I can create more what I want and be more free and feel that I am at that point of a thousand true followers and and I'm to eat that coming out my mouth's bizarre to even think that a thousand people are interested in in what you do Kim mm -hmm. isn't that amazing but it doesn't come from fresh air does it you've worked hard at your channel you've worked hard at what you've been doing how long have you been doing this now on youtube kim i think it must be six seven years is it i think it's i think it's seven i've totally lost count to be honest i kind of got to the stage where i'm just like i do yeah. it because i love it and i've kind of lost complete you know count of yeah. how long i've been doing for it when i started all these things because it just I think you just kind of get to a point I know I don't know I have anywhere where I feel like especially recently I've just stepped back and I've just thought I'm creating what I'm creating because I love it it's like with this podcast I've started this podcast because I love speaking to people I love connecting with people and I realize that we all have a story yeah. to tell and no matter what avenue these podcast conversations go down somebody's going to take something from it and your um, reference there to what Sean Tucker says about if you've got a thousand true fans or followers you can pretty much make it mm -hmm. I've heard that so much recently it's, it's in a lot of business books um, a lot of stuff surrounding oh. that in psychology and stuff as well um, and it's true you know people are striving for all these numbers but actually if you have a thousand loyal fans or followers and in some people's cases only a hundred you know depending on how much you know your products or services are even a hundred can sustain yeah. somebody and i know we're kind of going yeah. off on a little bit of a tangent here but we are entering a time i really feel in in the world where we're seeing that corporate jobs and stuff are, are falling by the wayside things are getting replaced by robots yeah. and ai um a lot of people have lost their jobs in the last few years as a million people are aware yeah. and people are starting businesses now and everything is kind of starting up from the grassroots up so regardless of whoever's listening you know if you're into photography if you want to start a youtube channel a podcast or or any business anything that excites you and that interests you and particularly in the creative realm it's about finding that community those people that 
that follow you as a person because people um, invest in people and that's I think the way the world's going to go I think we're going to stop investing in big corporations because we're realizing how corrupt they are and we're going to start investing in genuine people that we resonate with who have that human touch and who we want to support them because we're all these small little people trying to make a living and survive yeah. and we we want to help each other um and the more authentic and genuine we can be in what we are creating and producing you know it's not really about the other people it's just about us being genuine to ourselves and then that attracts yeah. more genuine love and, and like from others and i think it's exciting the world we're going yeah. into there's a lot of obviously youtubers a lot of yeah. podcasts now but we don't need tens hundreds of thousands of people we just need that small community that like us and what we do and can connect with us and yeah it's it, it's beautiful it's really really beautiful i think it's exciting don't you think it is it's a very exciting time you've so hit what i feel in creativity especially what's happening right now we're talking hundreds of miles away from each other about something we love, photography, and <laughs> creating a podcast. Just we're, we're we're publishing a radio station in our own homes. It's just what an incredible time! Mm. And I see my kids the recording on video, and creativity has never been as dominant. I don't think as it is right now, mm. and there's room for everyone. There is. It's really if, interesting if you make genuine, the analogy. Yeah. It's really interesting though, that you make the analogy or whatever about us producing a radio station because it's funny, a few years ago my dream was to become a TV presenter and I did some work experience with the BBC and all that kind of stuff and I came to realise, like, when you work for like, people like that, you're very contained. You get told what to say, you get told what to do. There's yeah. a lot of people, you know, get in trouble if they say certain things on social media, if they're, you know, related to these corporations. But now we're kind of bringing the power back to ourselves and we're able to create our own radio station. YouTube is our own TV channel. Like, we don't need mm -hmm. these people anymore. We can create whatever our dream is, whatever it is creatively, we can create that for ourselves. Um, and the more authentic we are, the the easier it is. But it is, it's amazing. And I'm really glad that you're kind of tapping into this as well and, and really feeling it because there's a lot of fear in the world just now, I think. A lot of people are very scared of what's falling yeah. away. And, and But through that, people are being connected with their creativity more and connected to nature more because they are our essence and they are how we can express ourselves. And... Yeah, you're, you, and obviously photography, your photography is very much connected to nature. So I think it might be quite nice now actually to speak about nature because that's one of the huge parts of photographic connections. So, you know, your love for nature stems back to your childhood. But now thinking about your photography, like what does it do for you going out into nature and combining that with creativity, whether it's your photography, your YouTube or any other creative venture that you, you, you take part in? Oh, there's there's hundreds of benefits, isn't there? They're just physically, mentally, and after, even after the shoot or after a walk or going out with the camera, and not just in nature as well, um, with people, connecting with people, street photography maybe, in landscape photography though, going out with someone as well, um, I used to do meetups, but I still meet up with a few people. We have an Instagram group and that excitement and bond amongst people when you're out in the landscape and in nature and say, you're going to do a 15 or 10 mile hike up in the mountain down the other side. There's a camaraderie as well. So I think a lot of the time people think of nature as a solo, almost selfish act of, oh, I'm... I mean, you know, the woods or the Glen or I'm in, on the coast. And, and yes, it, it is a, a great solitude thing to do as well. But I have found that once you connect that with a few people, it, 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 it can become so much more. But it's like everything, isn't it? There's a time and a place and a mood. And it's how you feel at the time. And, like, I find that... Sometimes I look at me watch and I think sunsets at twenty past seven, 
I've got an hour and a half to get to Formby and I'll jump and go on my own, jump in the van, get there, rush down to the coast and the exhilaration of fresh air, your heart's pounding, you feel the, the, the breeze, you, you see the storms coming in, you, you're enveloped by it, you're covered and smothered in, in nature and, and you don't realise it, you don't know because it's natural. It's natural to be in that environment. It's the most natural place we can be. And then the connection, you, the camera, and then the camera with the landscape through seeing, through spending time breathing, looking, senses are opened. You feel the air again, you smells, you know, you're in the woods, in the trees. You're starting to see the way shapes form, contrast, colour, what's under your feet, what's happening all around you. And within, I'd say, half an hour, I like, I can't, I'm going to come up with a word for this. Maybe not tonight, but when you first go out, you're, you're miles away from where you want to be with the camera and the photographer. But within a half an hour of, of looking, seeing, breathing, walking through um, the woodland or the coast or the mountains or the streams and walking through certain scenes you start to notice you start to get a sense of depth a sense of connection between one tree and another and they become characters to you they could become scenes of of conversation or the sounds of bird uh, especially at sunset now you get the blackbirds and thistle you get uh, you can hear linnets and there's, there's these little noises that permeate and and they're almost like a melody and, and you don't realize it but there's a there's a song and and you're being led deeper into that consciousness of seeing and and that's when i think that's when your images start to happen and if you're lucky you get light you, especially in a woodland at sunset at this time of year possibly a month two months ago i love that time of year when it's low the light's low and it seems to hang around for a very long time and you get that um, glow or you get that kind of permeating through the woods and one side of it's quite dark and frosty or scurry, you know. And, but there's characters in that that are, reach out and tell a, a, a story. And I think nature and photography, well, just the benefits of seeing like that, the benefits of, of opening your mind like that and becoming, and becoming uh, creative because it's talking to you uh, again i don't want to sound all like hippy dippy <laughs> i'm like really at far out man but you can't help it anyone if you walk your dog and you're not a photographer people walk past me and they go oh what are you photographing a bird or whatever oh it's lovely here isn't it oh it's so quiet and it's people are instantly connecting without actually having any form of creativity once you put a camera in your hand that's the completeness for me mm -hmm. that's where you really do start because you're trying to oh you take a portrait of someone you want to take a portrait that shows the best side it shows the character whether they would be laughing snarling happy sad angry i see that with the trees and you see that with the coast if it's stormy you want to catch it when it's growling at you you want to be covered in rain soaked and know that in that camera you've genuinely connected with that environment at the time mm -hmm. that you've got something whether it's great or it doesn't matter whether whether it's you know it's never <laughs> we don't go out and think we're gonna get you know we're gonna be get these great fancy amazing portfolio images sod all that it's about just making sure that whatever you're doing and when you're out in those conditions you photograph it don't walk away and think mm, you know it's dull there's no light I, even then there's something and and mm. that's nature isn't it that that's where you one your heart's beating you're getting excited you're filling your mind you're enthusiastic all these are creating chemicals and they're exploding in your brain and your body and all this stuff's going on your adrenaline you're starting to feel 
alive and there's a scene in Highlander where Sean Connery he's like he's there and he's he's rubbing his feet in the sand and he's going woof like that and he's saying to the other guy can you feel the quickening and and he's, he's he can hear the sounds of the sea and he can the seagulls and then he's breathing and the, he can hear the heart of a horse beating and he starts running and he's pegging it down this beach and that sums up nature for me that that film that connection with your heart your soul your mind and then stick a camera in there what can i say wow isn't it good (laughs) oh my gosh yeah i could just listen to you speaking about this forever it's it's you've got so much passion and joy and enthusiasm (laughs) I find it really interesting, um, this happens a lot, but people, when they start getting really deep into their connection with nature, they start making references, as you have a few times tonight, about not wanting to sound hippie. Um, But it's funny because we've kind of lived in this world where this connection to nature and these deep feelings and emotions and creativity has, over the years, made us become this outsider, this strange hippie, or even, in some cases, um, I kind of... One thing I feel within myself over the last few years is I've become a very spiritual person. To me, being in nature is a spiritual experience. It's very different to religion. Yes. It's about connecting to your heart, you know, your soul, and this spiritual connection. But the moment you say to somebody you're a spiritual person, they're like, oh, gosh, you're this hippie, weird person that <laughs> worships crystals and does this and does that. But, you know, all this stuff is what we did, like, years ago. Yeah. And we've lost touch with it to the point where we've been seen as like witches or outsiders or hippies. And I I really feel in the next few years that's going to start shifting and people are going to reconnect with nature deeper again and this creativity deeper again. And it's about, I feel like we're, we're having this reset just now of almost going back to our innate what our ancestors, what was innately within them. You know, us humans began life as cavemen where we lived completely in nature, living off of the land. And it's only through this civilization world that we've got into that we've lost that connection. And it's now, I guess, through the events of the last few years, we're now being almost forced but in a very nice way to reconnect with this to reconnect with each other the whole tribes or community to reconnect with the natural side of nature and your connection with nature yeah. is very apparent and i think it'd be really interesting actually if you have you got any kind of tips because with regards to how you connect when you're out with your camera because when you were speaking there about being out in the field and being in the woodland and seeing the light and seeing these creatures in the trees you seem to very naturally just be able to be drawn into the landscape to connect and to disconnect from everything else going on and really feel at one with nature and a lot of people really struggle with that so is that something that's always been within you and has come naturally to you or have you done things over the years to help you develop that deep connection which then plays out in your photography and whatever techniques you decide to use with your camera? Oh, another brilliant question. Um, <laughs> it's deep. We're getting deep it, here, Mally. We're deep. We mentioned it before about when we were kids. And I think that opens the doors at a very early age. And I think that might be why I possibly find it, say, easier. It is easier to be distracted, though. But the point is, is to clear your mind. And that's easy for me. <laughs> I'm laughing because <laughs> I like to joke about myself that I'm not this deep philosophical, you know, I'd love to be. But then it catches me up on my blind side and someone says, you are actually. And I go, oh, no, I'm not. I'm that guy who shouts silly. And I, it, I, I'm i just kind of um, simple, keep it simple. And I think that's the key when you're in nature is... If you're not feeling great, and it's not, you know, don't don't force it. Go away, come back. Don't, you know. But for me, um, when the rest of the world around you is about deadlines, or it's about um, there's too much salt in your tea, or <laughs> you know, you drink too much alcohol, or whatever. I, I don't, by the way, but I do like a pint. But you know, like everyone. But you get what I'm saying. We all have these distractions, these crutches. Programming. We're all programmed. So deprogramming comes easy because you're somewhere that doesn't shout, 
doesn't make noise that alarms you. You're somewhere that's filled with sensory, smells, visual elements. You're walking, so your heart's pumping. Within, I say, a half an hour, and I think that's key. I think if you go out there and you jump out your car and you think, right, and blah, 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 and you, it's like everything, isn't it? We expect everything immediately, and it's not. It, it's slowing down, although I, I, I don't slow down with my photography. If I see something, I'll grab it and take it. I'm not one of these people who spend half an hour working a scene. I have to connect with it. I have to connect with it quite rapidly. This happens through either this process of aesthetics, it's pleasing, and I will then move around, but I won't overdo it. I'll take the shot and move on, or I may walk around a little bit, but it's how do you feel about that at that moment? So the tip for me is it's, it's not to rush, it's to keep calm, let the senses and your sensory overload fill with things that are not alarming. You're not in an area or a place, if you're in the landscape especially, in the woods, in a stream, the sound of the river, focus on elements. It's bird song for me. It's the sounds that just permeate through. That's why I love woodland so much. But again, I did, as I said, opened up saying, I think when you're younger, that has had a, a part to play with why I am and the way I speak now. And I, and I know it. I know that some people may struggle with that, but because they're trying to look for a composition, you don't need to look or try. They're already there. It's just you need to stand in the right place, and you stand in the right place when you get excited. You're walking and you're seeing. You could walk past a thousand, but when you turn around and you come back, you might see them again. It doesn't matter. What I mean is, it's like. We, we're programmed worry stress look 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 i need to get a shot i need to get a shot i need to get, i need to do this i need to do this i can't do this oh oh my god oh, i'm rubbish at this oh look at that it's terrible and you're filling your head with this chatter 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 and it's like stop listen to the birds get your camera out and just take some shots meaningless they may be they might not mean nothing walking 50 yards half an hour into your walk you're warming up. It's like anything. It's like you wouldn't go picking weights up and just start lifting the biggest weights because you'd bust a muscle. Or you wouldn't run a marathon if you didn't train. You wouldn't. You wouldn't snooker. Snooker's one. You focus your mind. You, you. 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 The shots and what's happening next. You're not thinking about um, all this other stuff. So, so focus. Quiet and calm. Don't let things overwhelm you don't think you're crap don't think you're good just do it just get lost in the sounds the smells where you are and just get your camera out and just keep taking pictures and the more you do that because again i'm still learning i'm sure you are kim and i'm sure it'll go on till we drop dead this will never end it, it's never ending it's it's a it's endless, isn't it? And and that fills me with hope and happiness, the fact that there's so much to come. Because I hear some people and I feel for some people and they say, I fell out of love with it, I can't do it anymore, or I'm not interested anymore or whatever. That That's down to, I think, a, a conscious decision, the, a negativity, and it's not about walking around being smiley, I'm happy, it, and fake on it it's a genuine spend some time slow down don't push it get rid of all the noises in your head all the voice that's telling you you can't do this you can't do that that don't work just take it if unless you're shooting film it doesn't matter does it just take the shot and if you get back and you think that doesn't work here's here's another one you get back you think that doesn't work you've got 50 shots Take two of those shots. So let's keep it to the threes while we're photographers. Take three of those shots and pick out of all them three that you can't, you might not even like them. You might think, do you know what? I'm not even sure, but just pick three. Get those three and then start at the beginning. Aspect ratio. What works with this 
style of shot, whether it be a tree shot or coast, does it lend itself to being elongated? Are there shapes and forms in it that are spreading out across the frame? Is it compact? Is it very full of contrast? What would you like it to be? How was the memory of that time you was there? Well, there was birdsong. Well, there was light. And I was happy. I was calm. And, and it, I felt like quite, oh, it reminded me of when I was 15 and had been on a geography thing with school and there was laughter. And, and so all these things then it, um, give you your image. So that one image you've done, move on. Mm. your three images by the time you've edited those three images whether it by by it being fantastical its expression or you're keeping true to the scene and the image whatever you, it is you do making a conscious effort to edit three and try to make them look aesthetically pleasing for yourself and others not to please others but to make something that has beauty that has a, a real a real connection that you go, I like that. I like that. And I guarantee you the next time you go out, you'll see more. And the next time you go out and you see more, and it just grows and builds and grows. And you'll find your own calling. You'll find your own techniques. You'll find your own way of quietening. You'll find your own way of seeing. You'll know how long it is until you connect, until it happens. And, yeah, I could go on all night about that mm. because I think it's it's so important that people love love. There's another one, you know. We're not supposed to talk about love these days, and and I and I think your heart and your soul and love and being invested into what you're doing is what produces something that people see it. People see that you've put effort into that. People mm. feel that love and conscious. It, it almost it's it's buried in the image that you, people can look and go, do you know what, the, I love that, but guess what, I love that because I know they do. And that passes on from one to another to another. You're not mm -hmm. just doing it for the sake of it, you're doing it because you consciously love that image or love that moment in time you did it. Oh my gosh, Molly, I'm getting emotional listening to you. This is... This oh, sorry. Is, <laughs> no, in, in a very good way. In, in what you've just described there with regards good. to love, yeah. it's I'm feeling this like incredible unconditional love coming out of you, sharing what you're sharing right now, because everything you have just said is the essence of life. I mean, there is nothing in life apart from unconditional love. Like when we get into a stage of unconditional love and we we express ourselves and connect with the world from that place, from our heart, it's like we become it one with with life it's oh there's so much in what you just said there and a lot of what you were describing about stepping back and thinking about the sounds and everything it's it's like a form of, of meditation it's mindfulness practice and mindfulness is so yes. incredibly powerful and one thing I regularly say is, you know, if you're struggling to find an image, sometimes just sit down, close your eyes for a minute, take some deep breaths, just listen to what's going on around you. And then when you open your eyes, you see the world in a new light because you've taken that minute to just slow down, to reflect, to calm your mind, to yep. calm your breathing and reset. Um, and it's interesting as well that you, you said there about... Um, if you're going out and you're not feeling it then some days you just aren't feeling it and yeah it's good to try and take some images regardless but some days you do just need to kind of just say you know not today try again tomorrow and it's really interesting because yeah. I was interviewed on a podcast this afternoon actually and I was asked the question what do you do when you turn up on location and your mojo's not there that day and I, I kind of said you know there are some days when you do go out and you just don't feel it and it's okay to to, to go home and not take any images or to take some images even if you're not quite feeling it but I felt this pressure to say just take images and force yourself to take images because there's something there and yes mm -hmm. there is something there there's always something there but when you're listening to your body there are some days when we're just not feeling creative we actually need to go home and rest um, and recuperate and then come back out when we yes. are feeling that way so Gosh, your philosophy is, is so, so beautiful. And I could honestly sit and speak to you all night about this, Mally. And I think I'm going to have to invite you back on again in the future because I feel can. like this conversation is Thank only you. half done. Um, 
but yeah just oh I, I don't even want, i don't want to end there's just so much more going through my mind but i think we, we probably should tonight because we're almost yeah. up at the we're yes. almost up at the hour so um it wow. would be good oh, yeah. to, i know i know time flies when you're having fun um <laughs> For anybody listening that's really resonated with, with you and what you've been saying today, which I think, I hope a lot of people do, um, where can people find you if they'd like to connect with you? Oh, well, I'm I'm on everything. Like, I, I love social media um, and I love sharing my photography. But Mali Photography, M-A-L-I, photography.co.uk. And that's my base. That's my website. I don't update it as much as I used to. I still do. Put some new images on it last week. Um, but from there, you can find all about me. But I'm on Facebook, Twitter, and my podcast is Let's Create the Photography Show. Uh, different name because I have a group that's connected to that on Facebook that I've been running for quite some time. That um, I have a, a really good group of people who there's no critique, criticism. Everyone shares and everyone helps and and loves photography together and that's let's create on facebook as well and i also have a, a sister group called i see trees that runs itself and is mainly a place to put images of trees and just to spend time on the even not posting you don't need to post you can just join that group and uh, just scroll through and see nature by hundreds of people I, I love that. I'm so proud of the groups on Facebook. I just wish I could expand them more. Facebook's a bit, a bit it's not great for, uh, I think, a community, but we have built quite a big community on Let's Create. So, uh, yeah, if you want to join me on there. But everything is at M-A-L-I, so malephotography.co.uk, and you'll find everything there. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And maybe some of the listeners of this will come onto your YouTube channel and help you get to that 10,000 subscribers that you're, you're dreaming oh, of getting this see, year. See, I forgot about that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I know, I know. I could, I, I could have used this moment then. To <laughs> <laughs> like, subscribe. I see this is why it's not, you know, it's about the photography, Kim. Mm. Uh, yes, YouTube's a great platform for promoting yourself, but photography, oh, yeah, that's the core. That's the mm. heart. 100% but it's your your story your philosophy that I think will connect people to what you do and and like I said I do hope that people that have listened to this tonight that or today whenever they listen to it whatever time of day um that you know they resonate with you and that they kind of yeah because what you're doing is is very open and honest and I think we need more people like that in the photography world in, in any sphere oh. of life actually um you're lovely Mally and I love your philosophy and thank you oh. so much for for taking the time to, to speak thank with me this evening. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Very kind words. Thanks so much. You're such a oh lovely, lovely person to talk with. And I hope we do this again. Oh, I'm sure we will, Mally. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this week's podcast. It really does mean the world to me. If you'd like to learn more about Photographic Connections and get further involved in the community, you can do so by heading to photographicconnections.com. Now that this podcast has come to an end, there's only one thing left for you to do. It's time to pick up your camera and head outdoors. There's so many incredible photographic opportunities just waiting for you to discover. Mm -hmm.